Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series is a fairly new series. We're on lesson two now. For covering, I'm sorry, the Gospel of Mark. This is a lesson for July 13 of 2024, entitled, A Day in the Ministry of Jesus. As usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. A kind and wonderful Father, we, you sent your Son so long ago, and here in this world, and we are going to have this opportunity during this series of lessons to talk about what he did and why he did it. That will be very, very educational. Guide us in our thoughts together is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The Gospels are each unique in some way. How does the Gospel of Mark recount the beginning of Jesus' ministry? Now, first of all, I'd just like to say up front that we saw last time that the Gospel of Mark is actually almost certainly the Gospel according to Peter. Peter spoke it to, and Mark wrote it down. Um, so that's the first thing we would want to say. But we also notice that each gospel introduces the beginning of Jesus' ministry in a particular way. So how does Matthew start? Genealogy. A ge genealogy and talks about his birth. And then how does Mark, well, we're going to talk about Mark. How does Luke start? <sighs> genealogy of Jesus. Jesus well, there. genealogy comes in chapter 3. three. According to what we read, it's about the uh, ser Jesus' sermon in the synagogue. Okay, that's chapter four. But the first couple of chapters are about his childhood and his growth up, his growth as a youth. He, he, Luke talks more about that than anybody else. He grew. And then, of course, John starts out with... In the beginning... In the beginning was the word. Was the word. Uh, the word. He talks about his father. Right. Not his hu any human father, his divine father. But going on here, it says, Matthew presents Jesus calling disciples, then preaching the Sermon on the Mount. Luke tells the story of Jesus' inaugural sermon on the Sabbath in the synagogue in Nazareth. We'll get to that. John recounts the calling of some of the early disciples in the wedding at Cana, where Jesus performed his first sign. Sign, what's that? The Gospel of Mark recounts the calling of four disciples and describes the Sabbath in Capernaum and what followed. That's from our Bible study guide for Sabbath afternoon, July 6. It's very likely that Peter, Andrew, James, and John were part-time disciples of John the Baptist before the ministry of Jesus began in Galilee. Since, as we discussed in the prior lesson, the Gospel of Mark is actually Peter's Gospel. This Gospel begins with events when, the, when John the Baptist was arrested and put in prison. So what do you think happened to his followers when he was arrested and put in prison? Did they all stand around the prison? <laughs> no, they certainly didn't. Maybe, maybe they protested. Would be nice. At that time, Jesus, realizing the hazards if he stayed in the area of Jerusalem, we'll talk about that a bit more, left Judea where he had been ministering for about a year and moved to Galilee. There Jesus established his residence, Capernaum, at the home of... Peter. Peter. So this lesson will discuss the numerous miraculous events discussed in Mark 1. So we're going to see that Mark is into action. He wants this to happen and then the next thing to happen and so forth. And some people have suggested, scholars have suggested, and I think this is a very like, likely possibility, that Mark was probably writing from Rome. And he was writing to a Roman audience. Luke talks a, has a long discussions and, and discourses and so forth, because that's what the Greeks did. But the Romans, they wanted action. And so... Uh, but the word that really sticks out to me when I study Mark is immediately. Yeah, immediately, <laughs> immediately. yes, or at once. At once, yes, yeah. sir. So this lesson will discuss the numerous miraculous events discussed in Mark 1, 16 to 45. In the Gospel, Mark did not spend a lot of time discussing the sermons or discourses of Jesus. The emphasis of Mark has been on action, especially miraculous healings. What Often, other healings are there besides miraculous healings? Okay, well, mm -hmm. well, you and I do come some kinds of healings that aren't miraculous. Well, uh, it's a little yeah. different. So, but well, in Jesus' time. Yeah. 
Often in Mark, he described the story as moving immediately, as Charles mentioned, from one event to another. Okay, Jim, take us to Mark. Mark chapter 1, verses 16 to 20. As Jesus walked along the shore of Lake Galilee, he saw two fishermen, Simon and his brother Andrew, catching fish with a net. Now let, let me interrupt for just a second. Simon is another name for who? Peter. Peter. For Peter, yes. Okay, so we're talking about Peter and Andrew. Go ahead. Jesus said to them, Come with me, and I will teach you to catch people. At once they left. There you go. The nets and went once. with him. At once, <laughs> immediately. He went a little farther on and saw two other brothers, James and John, the sons of Zebedee. They were in their boat getting their nets ready. As soon as Jesus saw them, he called them. They left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and went to with Jesus from the American Bible Society. Now, does that seem a little just sort of off the cuff bang? Would you, would you, if someone walk, you were doing something on the seashore and someone comes along, follow me? Would you say, um, Excuse me, what's your name? Why, why do you want me to follow you? If you and, don't know what went before, then that seems rash. Yeah, okay, well, let's talk about what, what might have, went, have gone before. Mark mentioned that James and John worked with their own boat and their father catching fish. He did not mention that Peter or Andrew had a boat. However, later it was mentioned that by Luke, later that was mentioned by Luke. Remember that the Gospel of Mark is really Peter's Gospel, we said that already, that may explain the difference between the wording about the two sets of brothers. Just guessing. If all we had was the book of Mark, we would be surprised to see Jesus walking along the shores of Galilee, suddenly calling two groups of brothers, and they left their work immediately, Charles, and followed Jesus. But as we noted earlier, when we compare the stories about these disciples, particularly with the Gospel of John, we discover that Peter, Andrew, James, and John had been following John the Baptist back at the time when Jesus was baptized. They apparently were following John the Baptist off and on during the next year. They also followed Jesus part-time while he was carrying out his under-the-radar ministry in the territory of Judea. The three synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, spend most of their time discussing events that occurred in Galilee. So let's talk about that for a moment. Uh, Jesus is baptized. Shortly thereafter, he goes up to the wedding in Cana of Galilee. But over the ne approximately next year, he was working, we just get some, a few hints of this, he was working in Judea. He was being very cautious and very much under the radar, as we say in English, because of what? He didn't want to openly oppose the religious leaders. Exactly. He didn't fear want of being terminated. He didn't want to stir them up too quickly. But then when John the Baptist was arrested, and whether that was the main reason, <coughs> but it happened at that time, Jesus said, okay, I need to move my ministry to Galilee, where it's a little less, a um, few less uh, Pharisees and Sadducees wandering around. And so that's when we pick up the Gospel of Mark. But he, he called them by, uh, by their right name. I mean, even yeah. from the very beginning. Well, it's he, very, yeah, it's very possible that James and John, and I say this, there's not, no proof of this, but it's very likely, they were Jesus' cousins. Yes. So that, by explain that, but Peter and Andrew, there, there were not, but what I'm talking about is Jesus uh, calling um, the church leaders at the yeah. time. He never messed around. <laughs> he yeah. called them who they are. But uh, yes, you're right. Uh, when uh, John the Baptist was arrested, da, 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 okay, I'm going to move down and uh, safer to move to Galilee safer. because his ministry had just started. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. there was time. Fullness of time probably didn't come yeah. for him to have, go straight to the... Okay. There were fewer ears, so-called, in Galilee than in yes. the area of Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Yeah. These men followed Jesus, linking with uh, thinking, remember, notice this, thinking that he would become the king of the Jews and they would be exalted to high positions in the new government. So let's be clear about that. They were fishermen and they thought they were 
just moving up to high, high levels in Very government. Very quickly. What would they have done if they had been able to see what was coming in their futures? As far as we know, all of the disciples except John died martyrs' deaths, unless you would call Judas a martyr's death. I think, I think they would still follow him once they realized who he was. Well, that hasn't happened yet. That's right. It, uh, almost okay, didn't Charles, you ready to take yes, on? Yes, sir. From the writings of Ellen White, Jesus chose unlearned fishermen because they had not been schooled in the traditions and erroneous customs of their time. Mm. Mm -hmm. They were men of n native uh, ability uh, and they were humble and teachable. Men whom he could educate for his work. In the common walks of life, there is many a man patiently treading the round road of daily toil, unconscious that there possesses powers which, if called into action, would raise them to the quality in world's most honored men. The touch of a uh, skillful hand is needed to arouse those dormant uh, features or faculties. faculties. It was such men that Jesus called to be his uh, cool. collaborators, and he gave them the advantage of association with himself. Never had the world's great men such a teacher. When the disciples came forth from the Savior's training, uh, they were not no longer ignorant and un uncultured. They had become like him in mind and character, and men took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Amen. Beautifully put together, Ellen White. Took and knowledge. These are of pages 251. Yeah. Beautifully put together. 250, paragraph one. Paragraph one, yes. Okay, it is unfortunate that we know so little about that first year of ministry by Jesus in the territory of Judea. Apparently, some of his eventual disciples worked with him from time to time. However, the time had come for them to become full-time disciples of Jesus. So what does Jesus do? By comparing John 1, 29 through 42 with Mark 1, we discover that the baptism of Jesus occurred in the fall of A.D. 27, and that the call of the disciples by the sea happened in the spring of A.D. 29. See the Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 5, pages 195 and 196 to see all the explanations. We don't so have about time. Two, two years. Year and a half. Year and, year and a half. half. Yeah, year and a half. Looking back at the story recorded by John, try to imagine how Simon Peter felt when his brother Andrew came to him and said, just imagine this. The Jews have been waiting for the Messiah to come for 400 years with no word. And your brother shows up and says, oh, we found the Messiah. Mm -hmm. And you say, uh... <laughs> Well, imagine the kind of excitement that announcement might have caused, or would it have been more likely to cause doubts? What do you think? I would suspect doubts. Yeah. Well, if you, I guess it would depend on what you knew about your brother. Yes. If you knew that he was not the kind of person who would, you know, jump at an occasion, but you knew that. This guy knows what he, and I'm sure Andrew didn't just say, we have found the Messiah. He said, da, 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 and these are the reasons we think he's the Messiah. And that would be, that would be something to hear. I want to hear all those things in detail when we, when we see the panorama. Hmm. Um, it is likely that in Peter's mind, the real ministry of Jesus, his work in Galilee began when after Jesus' arrest, after John's I'm sorry, after John's arrest, Jesus moved his activities to Galilee, and when Peter, Andrew, James, and John were called to be full-time disciples. So that's where we pick up the book of Mark. What would you do if you received a call like that from Jesus? Suppose you now that you know who it is, and he says, leave everything and follow me. 
Don't I, everybody talk at once. <laughs> I believe that time is coming. Yeah. Soon. Soon. Sooner than we think and we want to think. Mm -hmm. Remember that every one of us has been called to be a disciple, to spread the good news about Jesus Christ. How are we doing? To put this in perspective, notice this from Ellen White. From evangelism, she said, had Adventists after the great disappointment. Now, this was before there were Seventh-day Adventists. This was Adventists. Yeah, this is, yeah. After the great disappointment in 1844, held fast their faith and followed on unitedly in the opening providence of God, receiving the message of the third angel and in the power of the Holy Spirit, proclaiming it to the world, they would have seen the salvation of God the Lord would have wrought mightily with their efforts, the work would have been completed, and Christ would have come ere this to receive his people to their reward. And do we know when that was written? It's not written, it's not written down here, I can tell you, 1884. It's one long sentence that she wrote. <laughs> yes. Okay. But in the period of doubt and uncertainty that followed, uncertainty that followed the dis disappointment, <clears throat> many of the Advent believers yielded their faith. Thus the work was hindered and the world was left in darkness. Had the whole Adventist body united upon the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, how widely different would have been our history? Wow. Again, e evangelism 695.3. A very, very challenging short chapter in evangelism 694 to 697 on the reasons for the delay you might want to look it up and see and read it were there about hundred thousand adventists at the time uh from well no of, you mean you mean back in 1844 right the something something like a hundred thousand so, right, right but after the disappointment, oh, and then they came up with, well, we need to worship on Sabbath, etc. Probably they were left with four or five thousand. Okay, four or five thousand, yeah, wow. Mark began his story in earnest by telling the story of Jesus in the synagogue in Capernaum when he was approached by a demon-possessed individual. Jesus did not get excited or run away. He stood up to the demon-possessed man and commanded the demon to leave him. It is very interesting to note that the demon almost immediately recognized who Jesus was. Mm. What a contrast with the Jewish religious leaders. Hmm. Are you trying to say that the demons were more perceptive at recognizing well, God gonna, than the Jewish leaders? We're going to talk about that in just a moment. I think you are saying that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Do you think the demon who possessed that man wanted him to acknowledge who Jesus was? Let's be honest here. Let's think about this. How did this demon-possessed man know anything about Jesus? Who informed him about Jesus? Well, the guy who was there in the Garden of Eden. Yeah. Right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, would, would the devil have said anything to this demon-possessed man ab about Jesus? Oh, well, who was speaking? Hold on. Wait. <laughs> I, we're going to well, we're going to get into that. You know, as you know, Mark is a very short version, mm -hmm. and there's a lot that's left out. So this man, this demon possessed man, might have even followed Jesus for some time. I don't know, mm -hmm. obviously, but maybe he trailed around him and then got demon possessed. Yeah, the thing that makes raises questions about that in my mind is. The first time we know about that he meets, meets Jesus, he's shouting and carrying on in, in the church. So I think if he had been that kind of character, Jesus would have had some troubles with him in the past, earlier. Well, let's see, we're going to find out more about that. Myra? Okay, from Desire of Ages, Mrs. White says, Jesus in the synagogue spoke of the kingdom he had come to establish and his mission to set free the captives of Satan. He was interrupted by a shriek of terror. A madman rushed forward from among the people, crying out, Let us alone. What have we done to thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee, who thou art, 
and Holy One of God. Wow. So he, he knew who yeah. Jesus Okay, was. go ahead. All was now confusion and alarm. The attention of the people was diverted from Christ and his words were unheeded. This was Satan's purpose in leading his victim to the synagogue. But I'm, I'm going to interrupt for a second here. So Jesus is in the synagogue. He's trying to spread the message. He's trying to talk about his mission. And here's this interruption. So Satan clearly wants to interrupt anything that Jesus is trying to accomplish, right? Okay, let's be clear about that. Go ahead. Oh, now where was I? Um, in the middle of but that. But Jesus rebuked the demon, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. And when the devil had thrown him into the midst, he came out of him and hurt him not. He who was conquered, who conquered Satan in the wilderness of temptation and was again brought face to face with his enemy, the demon exerted all his power to retain control of his victim. To lose ground here would give Jesus a victory. But the Savior spoke with authority and set the captive free. Wow. That's from Desire of Ages, page two. Oh, so and a little bit later, let me just, just help you think about this, because we're going to come up to it a moment later. Jesus is setting who free? The demon-possessed people. Right. He is getting captives out of the de devil's control and letting them go free. So keep that in mind. We're going to talk about captives in a little bit. As you might have guessed, the news of what happened in Capernaum that day quickly spread through all of Galilee. Many Christians have some kind of experience in their lives that transform them to become committed Christians. Have you had any life-changing experiences? I would love to tell you about my story starting in boarding academy. I had some several life-changing experiences. This is an example of something that we see in several places in biblical history. Notice these particularly. Revelation 12. What happens in Revelation 12? The baby is born. Revelation 12. Revelation 12. Well, yeah, yeah, baby's born, but in terms of conflict, the war in heaven. War in heaven. Satan the war in heaven. Down. Jude 9. What's happening in Jude verse 9? Uh, also, Satan. So, so God is, is uh, Michael. fighting Michael with, up, right? over the body of Moses. Moses right. Exodus 6 to 9. The plagues of Egypt. That's the plagues of Egypt. Okay. 1 Kings 17 to 19. This one's a little not quite so obvious. Isn't that Elijah? At the Elijah on Mount Carmel. Mount Carmel right. Yes. And Matthew 4, 1 to 11, which we've already mentioned, the, the uh, temptations. So whenever there is a direct conflict, this is the point we want to make. Whenever there is a direct conflict between Jesus and Satan, Jesus wins. Okay? The same thing has happened in this was happening in this story. The demon would never have identified Jesus except to possibly misrepresent him. In this case, God took control of the demon-possessed man, spoke the truth. That's what I think. I think God was... I mean, I don't think the, the demon-possessed man had any option about what he was saying. God was speaking through him. The same thing happens in our lives almost every day. Satan wants us to do his will, while God wants us to do what is right. We could not in our own power defeat either of these powers. But God makes sure that we have freedom of choice. Jim, there you go. The only power we have is a power of choice. If we choose God's side, he will make sure we succeed. If we choose Satan's side, God in great disappointment Step, steps back and honors our choice. Okay, in chapter 1, Mark recorded many of Jesus' encounters with demons. From our Bible study guide, notable in Mark is Jesus' confrontation with demons. The gospel records the demonic forces that challenge Jesus' ministry, Mark 1, Mark 3, Mark 5, 6, 7, uh, 9, 16. These forces are described as evil or as unclean spirits. Mark describes the people whom these demons afflict as demon-possessed, nor the gospel concentrates on as many references to the forces of evil. So what are we going to say? That's from our, from our Bible study guide. 
So what are we saying? What are we learning here? Jesus, uh, I'm sorry, Mark, Peter, working through Mark, is focusing very strongly on direct conflicts between Christ and Satan. We're talking about the great controversy in action here. As noted in the Bible study guide, there are three aspects of Jesus' encounters with the forces of evil that are important to notice. Jim? Evil is present from the beginning of the ministry of Jesus, Mark 1, 23. Indeed, the first miracle of Jesus recorded in the Gospel of Mark was to cast an evil spirit out of a man in the synagogue of Caper Capernaum, Mark 1, 25. The demons could recognize what he, the master of Israel did not recognize in <laughs> relation to Jesus and his identity. The demons professed that Jesus was the Holy One of God, Mark 1, 24. The Son of God, Mark 11, Mark 3, 11, and the Son of the Most High, Mark 5, 7. Let me interrupt there for a second. Now, I suggested earlier that God was controlling things here. There's two ways he could, God could control this, these demon-possessed people. One way is to force the devil to admit what he knows is true. The other way is for God to speak through the demon-possessed person himself. Which do you think is more likely? Later. The latter? Yeah, later. One came. Okay, Jim, go ahead, number three. Jesus always overcame the demons. Mark reports that the demons excuse me, exclaimed, have you come to destroy us? Mark 1, 24. On the other occasion, the demons would fall down before him, Mark 3, 11. Jesus came, excuse me, Jesus cast the demons out of their human toasts, regardless of how many unclean spirits inhabited the life of the demon possessed, Mark 5, 9. Okay, Bible verses referenced in the above quotation for that. Just look at some of the references of what they said. Let's you want to take one and then we'll each take one here. Mark, Mark 1, 1, 25, Jesus ordered the spirit, be quiet and come out of the man. Good news, Bible. Gordon? In Mark 1, 24, the evil spirit screamed, what do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Are you here to destroy us? I know who you are. You are God's holy messenger. Myra? Mark 3, 11. And whenever the people who had evil spirits in them saw him, they would fall down before him and scream, are you the son of God? You are the son of God. You are the son of God. I'm sorry. Oh, God. <laughs> Let's be Big clear. This is on the wrong. Big difference. Wrong word. Mark 5, 7. And a man with an evil spirit screamed in a loud voice, Jesus, son of the most high God, what do you want with me? For God's sake, I beg you, don't punish me. Mm. Jim? Mark 5, 9, so Jesus asked him, what is your name? The man answered, my name is Mob. There are so many of us. And Charles again? Yeah. Mark 16, 9, after Jesus rose from the death early on Sunday, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had driven out seven demons. Yeah, we don't know anything about that. I don't know. Was it seven different times or seven demons all at the same time? We don't know. There's an awful lot of things that happened in Jesus' ministry that we don't know. Yeah, look but at But at the, least we know that he drove demons out of Mary Magdalene. So the Bible study guide continues saying... Consider this insightful study. Uh, actually, Gordon, why don't you jump on that Consider one? this insightful study, originally written in Spanish, on the liberation of the demon-possessed person in the synagogue. Jesus has the power because he is the Son of God, the anointed of God, possessed by the Holy Spirit. The word of Jesus makes the sovereignty of God effective. The impure spirit opposes that sovereignty and challenges Jesus while desecrating the sacred place in the, the syn of the synagogue. The demons may protest, but they cannot prevent the sovereignty of God from spreading rapidly through the liberating power of the word of Jesus. That's uh, from Ricardo Aguilar, and the reference is given there. In Spanish. Written in Spanish. 
Okay. Then Jesus is the one who has come to establish the kingdom of God, he is supreme above all demonic spirits. Jesus' dominion is an everlasting dominion. His dominion includes supremacy over earthly powers and evil spiritual forces alike. In the Gospel of Mark, Satan is designated as a defeated enemy from the Teacher's oh. Bible Study Guide. This gentleman, this scholar, believes that uh, the total picture in Mark is that Satan is clearly a defeated enemy. How many, how many, now, now let's talk about how we would have reacted in that situation. How many people in the synagogue that day really believed that Jesus was the Messiah? Here's a demon-possessed person that I'm sure they all knew him. I'm sure they all knew him, saying that this is the Messiah. What did they think when this demon-possessed man stated that fact? Well, did the brother believe his brother saying, we have found the Messiah. We found the Messiah. Yeah. From the Bible study guide. Next, the command. Hold on. Let me. Okay. Meanwhile, the re Jewish religious leaders were denying that it was even possible that Jesus could be the Messiah. I mean, look at he's poor. In order to be a Messiah, you have to be rich. You have to be well off. You have to be this poor guy. No way he could be the Messiah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Despised and rejected of men. Isn't that one mm -hmm. of the yep. attributes of the way the masses looked at Jesus? Okay, but Myra, sorry for the interruption. Uh, no, no. Next, I command to come out of the man. The command. Uh, the command to come out of the man is un understandable. But why the command be quiet? Beginning here in Mark, a remarkable motive of appears Jesus call for silence regarding who he is scholars call this the messianic secret okay but before you go on why would Jesus tell these healed individuals not to say anything if the word gets around Jesus is going to be flooded with people coming in coming for healing for physical healing not spiritual healing Okay. And he's going to come in conflict even quicker with the religious authorities of the day. However, soon he's going to go across the Sea of Galilee and he's going to run into one or two demon-possessed people over there and he casts out their demons and then what does he tell them? Go, go and, and preach. Yeah. Go and tell everybody. Yeah. <laughs> it was time. Well, yeah. the difference was that was not in Jewish territory. That was yes. not in Jerusalem, especially. Yeah. That was out in the, shall we say, the heathen country. Yes. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Jesus' call for silence makes good sense because of the political overtones of the messianic expectations in his time. It was, risk, it was risky to claim to be the Messiah, yet... Mixed with the calls for silence are the unmistakable revelations of who Jesus is. What will become clear over time is that Jesus' identity cannot be hidden. The truth of who he is becomes the center of the gospel message. People need not only to know who Jesus is, but also to make the a decision about how they will respond to his coming and what it means for them. Try to imagine yourself in that synagogue on Sabbath morning when the demon was cast out of that man. You can be sure that every person in town knew about it almost immediately. Okay, Mark 1, 29 to 34. Jesus and his disciples, including James and John, left the synagogue and went straight to the home of Simon, Peter, and Andrew. Here's another, straight, which means immediately, right? At once. Remember, this is Simon Peter's gospel, as told to Mark and then written by Mark. Simon's mother-in-law was sick in bed with a fever, and as soon as Jesus arrived, he was told about her. He went to her, took her by the hand, helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. The gospel of Mark is the only gospel that mentions this incident. So why do you think it's mentioned in Mark? Because it's Peter's gospel. And it it's Peter's, Peter's gospel, and this is Peter's mother-in-law. Mm -hmm. 
After the sun had set and, e and evening had come, people brought to Jesus all the sick and those who had, had demons. All the people of the town gathered in front of the houses. And I'm going to interrupt myself for a moment here. In a small town the size of Capernaum, I mean, this is not a huge place, how many demon-possessed people were there? It's a whole colony of... I mean, would you like to live in a small town full of demon-possessed people? <laughs> anyway, Jesus healed many who were sick with all kinds of diseases and drove out many demons. He would not let the demons say anything because they knew who he was. Good news Bible. But Jesus can do more than cast out demons. After finishing the service, they proceeded to Peter's house, which was very close to there, uh, close by. There, Jesus encountered Peter's mother-in-law, was sick. Jesus touched her and made her well. She rose up and served them. It was often the case that Jesus healed by touching. He touched especially the people who weren't supposed to be touched. And there's examples, Mark 1 and Mark 5. But there were other times when he merely spoke. Mark 1 again, Mark 3, and Mark 5. It is interesting to note that people began to flock to Peter's house after sunset. This is consistent with the fact that Jesus and his disciples regularly and faithfully kept the Sabbath hours. As soon as the sun went down, notice these words from Alan White. Hour after hour, they came and went. To know, to none could know whether tomorrow would find in the healer since uh, among them. Healer still among them. Never before had Capernaum witnessed a day like this. The air was filled with the voice of triumph and shouts of deliverance. The Savior was joyful in the joy that he had awakened as he witnessed the sufferings of those who had come to him. He had stirred with, with his, heart. He was tired, his heart was tired with sympathy and he rejoiced in his power to restore them to health and happiness. I believe that the Lord's disciples will do this soon. Yes. Not until the last sufferer sufferer had been re, had been relieved uh, Jesus sees his work it was far into the night when the multitude departed and since the they settled down upon the home of Simon the long exciting day was past and Jesus sought rest but while the city was still wrapped in uh, slumber, the Savior, raising up, rising. great rising up, great, uh, great uh, while before day, went out and departed into the solitary place, and there prayed. Wow! Ellen White, Desire of Ages yes. two fifty nine. By the way, if you get our handouts, uh, the electronic format, and you want to check any of these references, if you. Uh, Double click on those little uh, links that are there. You can Hi hyperlinks. Hyperlinks there that you can uh, go and see it directly from the original source. As you can imagine, the people of Capernaum were very excited to have Jesus there. When he disappeared very early the next morning, as he went out to pray, people went looking for him everywhere. But Jesus made it clear that his ministry was not going to be just for Capernaum. He had to reach everyone in Galilee, and of course. His ultimate goal was to everybody in the world, wasn't it? Right. Another one of the aspects of Jesus' life that we see beginning here is his commitment for two times of prayer. Hmm. Luke 6, 12. At that time, Jesus went up a hill to pray and spent the whole night there praying to God. Now, I'm going to interrupt there for a second. We'll mention this a little bit later, but what happened the next day after the Luke 6, 12? He Remember? chose the disciples. He, he called the disciples. He called the, the, the 12 disciples yeah. now, all 12 of them. Go ahead. Same thing in Mark 14, 23. After sending the people away, he, that is Jesus, went up a hill by himself to pray. When evening came, Jesus was there alone. 
and Mark 6, 46, after saying goodbye to the people, hmm. he went away to a hill to pray. So what is your prayer experience like? Do you have set times for prayer? If we were to follow the example of Jesus, we would not only have set times for prayer, but also we would take opportunities to pray whenever it seemed appropriate. It is very likely that Jesus spent enough time in prayer every night to discuss with his Father what they would be doing, what they were going to do the next day. For example, Luke 6, 12, as already mentioned, Jesus spent the entire night in prayer in preparation for choosing his disciples mm. the next morning. So what is the relationship in your own life between prayer and your efforts to spread the gospel? What subjects do you think you're com comfortable in speaking about to non-Adventist friends? Are there certain people in our society that would qualify as lepers? Should we as Adventist Christians be trying to reach out even to them? Okay, well, let's go to that story. Another one of the stories about healing by Jesus comes up next in the first chapter of Mark. Yes, Mark 1, 40 to 45. A man suffering from a dreaded skin disease came to Jesus and knelt down and begged him for help. If you want to, he said, you can make me clean. Now, Jesus I'm going to interrupt for a second. Sorry for all these interruptions. According to Leviticus, what happens when you touch a person with leprosy. You become unclean. unclean. Okay. So Jesus touched him and, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Jesus was filled with pity and stretched out his hand and touched him. Do, I do want to, he answered, be clean. At once the disease left the man and he was clean. Okay, now the question is, was Jesus contaminated by touching the leper? <laughs> no, because when he touched him, he wasn't a leper anymore. <laughs> okay, go on. Then Jesus spoke sternly to him and sent him away at once after saying to him, listen, don't tell anyone about this, but go straight to the priest and let him examine you. Then in order to prove to everyone that you are cured, offer a sacrifice that Moses ordered. Okay, now why is that important? So he could return to society. Yeah. Yes, he, was an he outcast had to have a, as a leper. That's right. He had to have official sanction by the priest to say, "You're healed. You're okay now." And you, the, the priest couldn't say that about. I'm sorry. The priest couldn't allow him to make an offer, an offering, a sacrifice, until that had been declared. He, he touched this leper for two reasons, I believe. Mm -hmm. Because he loved him. Number mm -hmm. one. Number two. I think he liked to annoy the priests. Mm -hmm. He so liked I, to taunt them. So. Yeah. <laughs> so. so how many people were healed of leprosy other than by Jesus? How many times did the priest declare someone clean? Or was it that there was a misdiagnosis made and... It's possible. And, and their condition clean, I think, cleared I up. Think, uh, somewhere I read that all kinds of skin diseases were grouped well, as leprosy. So. Okay, well, the truth is, if you read the biblical records and even the ex external records from other sources, right. you can't be sure that leprosy was just what we today call Hansen's disease. It right. probably included some other skin conditions. So it's possible that some people recovered from some of these other conditions. And there are a few people who recover from leprosy, even without treatment. So, okay, finish up. Okay, in chapter, er, verse 45. But the man went away and began to spread the news everywhere. Indeed, he talked so much that Jesus could not go into the town publicly. Instead, he stayed out in lonely places, and people came to him from everywhere. Wow. Jesus instructed the man to go to the priest following the regular procedure for checking for uncleanness. The details of how to recover from uncleanness of various kinds are spelled out in Leviticus 13 to 15. It's a lot of detail, but it's pretty clear. Jesus told the man to be quiet about his healing. However, the man told everyone, are there some things that we need to be aware of and be quiet about when we are trying to spread the gospel? 
Ellen White has said quite clearly that we shouldn't immediately jump into our, some of our more controversial, um, you know, doctrines immediately. We should talk about the love of Jesus and so forth. What picture of Jesus does uh, Mark 1 present? I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. What picture is Jesus of Mark 1 present? Jesus has authority to call disciples and they respond. He is holy and con contrast to unclean spirits under Satan. A great battle is going on between good and evil and Jesus has more power than the demons. Jesus has compassion for sick people and helps them, touching them when perhaps no one else would from our Bible study guide. As we view Jesus performing some amazing miracles, we need to ask the question, did Jesus perform miracles in his own power or did he call for the power of the Holy Spirit or the Father to perform all those miracles? What difference would it make? No difference? Late, in some later lessons that I've already worked on a little bit, we're going to find out where she makes some specific statements about that. So we'll wait for that. Already in Mark 1, we've discussed something of Jesus' ministry in partnership with the Father, beginning in Capernaum and spreading to all of Galilee. We've talked about his prayer life, his authority, and some of his encounters with demons, and also the results. As we've already suggested, the gospel, meaning good news, is embodied in the scriptures. Okay, now I'm going to suggest something here. We, would, we, we have the privilege of taking the gospel by picking up the Bible. And we believe the Holy Spirit has inspired the, Holy, the gospel and, I mean the gospels especially, but the entire book. So we can, you know, entertain the work of the Holy Spirit by reading from scriptures and potentially sharing that with someone else. But Jesus, well, how much did he know about the Bible? The Old Testament, in his case. We know that people in his day memorized the entire Old Testament in Hebrew. Paul probably did. But Jesus wouldn't, I mean, Jesus was not, a, his family wasn't one of those people who had access to all those things. Now, obviously he, he was, he was versed in Scripture. Was he versed in Scripture because his father instructed him. His That's mother a, also instructed him. And his mother also instructed him. But did she have access to many of the scrolls? Do you think a young mother who had at least six other children to care for would have a lot of time to go to the, to the temple and, or to the, I'm sorry, to probably to the synagogue and borrow a scroll so she could... I, I'm, I'm trying to understand to myself how how all this happened. Or did both Jesus and Mary have good memories? And when the scripture was read in the synagogue or in the, mm -hmm. uh, in the synagogue, yeah. they, maybe they remembered it. Did they Jesus, had good memories, okay. good verbal memories. Yeah. <laughs> and now I'm gonna ask a question that's a real challenge in my mind. Did Jesus remember anything from his pre-incarnation? Did he remember taking part in Old Testament events, is what you're asking? Well, I mean, because sometimes he, he, he goes and he tells people the Old Testament says thus and so. He's talking about words that he himself inspired Old Testament writers to write. Before Abraham was. I am. Yeah. But now, did he, did he, how, how early in his life, the question really is, how early in his life did, did he know that? By age 12, so, before age 12. <laughs> yeah. That takes me to my college days when one of the big bosses suggested, and that got me the rebellious spirit in me. He says, he says, it is possible that before Jesus was 12 that he, may, he committed sins. No. Yeah, so you see, we are going into a little difficult place. I believe that from the very beginning, he had two natures, and the one nature held the universe in his hand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the human nature, he had to learn all of that. Well, Isaiah 7, That's 14 me. and 15. Yeah. He had to learn 
to reject evil and choose the good. Now, he can ob observe. It doesn't have to be a participant, but you can observe good and evil and, and, and make, the, make the decision, mm -hmm. make the choice. Everybody has to have that opportunity to make a choice between, okay. first of all, reject the evil. That's the human the side, and his mother helped him, and so did his aunt. Tremendous. Alan White, as you know, says specifically, talking about the childhood or the youth of Jesus, he was instructed by God the Father Amen. and also by angels. Well, already in Mark 1, we, we comment. Did you want to comment, Gordon? Oh. Already in Mark 1, we have discussed something of Jesus' ministry and partnership with the Father, beginning in Capernaum and spreading to all of Galilee. We have talked about his prayer life, his authority, and some of his encounters with demons, and also the results. As we've already suggested, the gospel, meaning good news, is embodied in the scriptures. But in the life of Jesus, it is lived out. Jesus was the gospel. Amen. He lived the gospel. It is, uh, did Jesus refuse to take credit for performing the miracles himself because he wanted to make sure that God the Father got credit? Or was he afraid to, of what people would, might think if he claimed divine power himself? And that's one of the questions we're going to discuss as we move along in future lessons. Okay, where are we ready for? Who's next? Jim. Mark portrays God as agent on 75 occasions. The explicit agency of God appears in association with 35 occurrences of verbs. Okay, that's a little bit of technicality things there, but Mark seemed to suggest that God is directly involved many, many times in these miracles. Can you think of a reason why Peter might have emphasized this cooperation between the Father and the Son so much? Mm. We, we're going to have some challenging questions in this series of lessons. We've already suggested that he's going to focus particularly on conflicts between God and Satan, right? Mm. Is that a reason? Is that a possible reason why he would more likely represent God the Father being involved? You might back to uh, you could. That what we were discussing a little bit earlier there, yeah. uh, John ten thirty eight, but if ye do, though ye believe not me, believe the works that ye may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in Him. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's uh, how that is all play, the mechanics of it. <laughs> we're, yeah. we're not one to really yeah. uh, di dictate the limitations on the part of the communication of the Father and the Son. Yeah. Yeah, maybe we'll understand it more, but anyway. It's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not essential. It, right? it's, uh, it's not essential. It is quite clear from Mark, as well as from some of the other gospel writers, that Jesus established his Galilean home in Capernaum. Why do you think he did that? Any ideas about why he did that? To get as far away from the Jewish leaders as he could. <laughs> Capernaum. Well, he could have gone. Well, Capernaum was a, as I recall, it was a Roman city, really, wasn't uh, it? Not quite. There was the Roman cities right. nearby, and it was a city. It was a city of. It was on the main travel route from from Mesopotamia to Egypt. But it was so, also on the Sea, right? Mm -hmm, it was right on the sea. And he loved fish. He liked the cooking of Peter's wife or his mother-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, well, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> After performing those miracles, after performing those miracles as recorded in Mark 1 and healing Peter's mother-in-law late into the night, Jesus apparently got up very early the next morning to pray. Do you think this was a regular habit for Jesus? Yes. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. It kind of looks like it. <clears throat> it was obvious that was some of the... And so that raises a question from my mind. After meeting all those people and dealing with all of them, it, did it did it weary Jesus to perform miracles? Mm. Physically, was he tired? No. I suspect he was uh, invigorated. <laughs> human side, I think he was tired. You know, here's a he human could talk being. to God all night and yeah. he was preach the gospel being. all day. 
He was a human being. But for this cause have I come, you see, mm -hmm. so. It was obvious that with some of those who had been healed, spreading the news about him everywhere, Jesus had to stay away from the towns and the cities to avoid being mobbed. Mark noticed specifically that Jesus planned some of his moves, following what he learned about what had happened to John the Baptist. So we've already mentioned that Jesus moved his ministry from Judea to Galilee at what point? What happened to John? When he was thrown in the prison. And when John, John the Baptist was, Baptist, Baptist was imprisoned. Right. Jesus, um, uh, when John the Baptist was beheaded and John's disciples came to Jesus to tell him what had happened, Jesus moved his ministry out of Jewish territory, even Galilee now, completely and into Gentile territory for the next six months. Why do you think that was? Preservation. Yes, but it actually turns out that that was a very special time for him to focus on, because he knows he's getting closer and closer to crucifixion. This was his special time to instruct his disciples. Okay. Um, who's next there? Me? Yeah. Jesus is portrayed in Mark's gospel as performing one action after another one we have one minute. Mark highlights Jesus' ministry as a, a series of events happening immediately after a previous incident. The Greek uh, adverb, euthos, uh -huh. translated as immediately, is at once, suddenly. In English, is found in 51 verses in the four Gospels and 41 times in Mark. Wow. Okay, I'm going to have to ask you to hold off there and go down. We're going to drop down here. It is evident that Mark's account is a gospel in motion, and Mark also underlines Jesus' ministries revolving around a life in prayer, those things we have seen so far. Mark mentioned in several places Jesus taught with authority. What do you think that means? I'm going to drop down to the bold part for Mark. God's authority is mediated by the word of Jesus, who simply pronounces. Mm. Okay, this explains why almost always when they came in contact with Jesus in opposition to him, one of the first questions was, who gave you that authority? Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you so much for the privilege we have of studying these challenging, thought-provoking messages from the Gospel of Mark. Help us to see how they can guide us to better represent you to those around us is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.